Welcome everybody, I'm Steve Hill, the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia. Thanks for joining us. For those choosing us live, thanks for choosing us ahead of either Gladys or Dan this morning. Uh, welcome to those that are joining Geoscience Australia's public seminar series for the first time. I'd uh, also like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the lands of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from across Australia. And we acknowledge and pay our respects to these people, particularly the elders. I'd also like to acknowledge that many of you are challenged at the moment um, as part of the world's COVID pandemic. And um, on behalf of Geoscience Australia, I wish you all the very best. And I wanna let you know that people do care about you and um, hope that um, this passes sooner rather than later. I also ask that we show some patience and understanding with what we're attempting to do with this seminar today. And I will thank in advance the great support from Geoscience Australia, the Geological Society of Australia, the ACT division, and the Australian Marine Science Association, ACT branch. With all of that, let's now get started. Um, what we're trying to do here today is hopefully give a new perspective um, that is consistent with the overall theme of uh, National Science Week. The theme there is food different by design. So we've adapted that to now present to you food by geoscience design and the geoscience of food from tectonic plates to dinner plates. Okay, so today's presentation, we're going to have four approximately 10 minute presentations that showcase um, the roles of geoscience in providing food. I think a lot of people think about geoscience, perhaps from the perspective of digging holes in the ground, looking at rocks, um, and perhaps into some of the other broader areas of um, ge geography as well as geology. Um, today, we want to really showcase how it relates to food. And um, besides myself, we're also going to be hearing from Dr. Andrew Carroll, who's Assistant Director for Marine and Antarctic Science at Geoscience Australia, Dr. Claire Krauss, Assistant Director of Product Development for Digital Earth Australia, and Dr. Anna Riddell, who's Assistant Director of National Geodesy. After that, we'll um, look to have a 10 minute question and answer session, where actually we'll take questions from, from the audience there, which you can do through the um, chat line in your um, in what you see, is to not only increase the perceptions of the value of geoscience, but change the way that you think about the food that's on your plate. What I'll be doing here is giving you an introduction to, um, to the topic uh, and talk about it perhaps from the most broad, broad sense. So here we see planet Earth. Um, no guarantee that people will be, um, aliens will be approaching Earth with North America presented right way up. This is how it may look. Um, and the reality is that this is where we live. This is what we rely on for our lives, including food. The challenge for us is the world population is approaching 8 billion people. And according to the United Nations, almost 700 million people are defined as being hungry today. And this number is expected to increase into the future. The reason that these people are hungry, due to a whole lot of reasons, but a big player there are a lot of our human activities, particularly things like wars. Uh, and now with COVID, we wonder what, what impact that might have. So that raises the question of how can we do better? Well, as I said, the United Nations have already identified this of the sustainable development goals. We have Goal number two, which really is aspiring to zero hunger. The reality is we're not doing particularly well in that sustainable development goal. So we do have to ask that question of what can we do better? And I think really across all of the sciences, there are opportunities for contributions here. But I really want to highlight today, and, and along with the other speakers, the role that geoscience can have in that. Um, but I also want to point out that the other SDGs, even though they don't directly mention food, they do have links to it, particularly ones like number six about clean water um, and the need um, for available water to sustain um, our food production. 
moving from the United Nations now to Geoscience Australia, just to let you know a little bit more about, about us, we've um, produced a key strategic document that we've called um, Strategy 2028, which is our decadal strategy. And within that, we have six main science impact areas. It's really interesting looking at all of these, they all have their specific roles in contributing value to our nation. Um, but what's really interesting that each of them also has some link to geoscience and food. And we're going to hear from uh, some of these areas today with presenters that are going to showcase some of the work in those impact areas. There's a couple that we won't hear so much about. Um, we'll hear a little bit about Australia's, uh, building Australia's resources wealth, particularly um, how energy um, resources uh, and also mineral resources are critical um, for food sustainability. Uh, community safety may at first seem a, a little abstract from this, but it certainly isn't because the data and advice that we can provide certainly helps with um, the distribution, the safe distribution in particular of food materials around the country. Um, the water resources part, the third one there, um, absolutely critical for um, sustaining food production. We're going to hear from Andy a bit about um, the marine jurisdictions and how that contributes. And then also um, Claire and Anna will speak a bit about creating a location enabled Australia. The last impact area there about enabling an informed Australia really highlights the importance of making sure that our data and our information is accessible to the people that need to make those decisions, particularly the government, industry and community. To start things off in a little more detail from me, um, if we look at um, our, some of our more well-known links that I think we all know, and geological substrate, which also includes soils, landforms, ground, you know, groundwater or water in the soil zone as well. And so it's very well established about the differences in soil properties and agriculture. Uh, I think anyone who's got a home garden and particularly a vegetable patch will know all about some of those ones. One of the most popular one, of course, is the interactions and relationships between growing grapes to produce wine and the French term terroir. And what that's looking at is how the complete natural environment of geology, soils, landforms and climate all interact to control how we can produce grapes to make a distinctive style and quality of wine. Um, other ones that are a little bit more um, sort of challenging to come at hand is, of course, the links between animals, geology, soil and landform. There's, there's a large part of um, work around geozoology and, and, and so forth. But in the food production area, one of the main areas, of course, is around the plant grazing relationships um, that, that then exploit that plant versus geology um, interaction. Things like pasture quality and nature of pasture uh, is a really good example there. Uh, and then also burrowing organisms, particularly the ones that can impact food production, such as rabbits, mice, and insects. Part of the locust cycle requires burrowing into particular substrates. And then another area that I wanted to highlight is really important, and that is about water and substrate, particularly the nature of the groundwater and how the characteristics of groundwater and the availability of it is very much controlled by geoscience. And striking to the heart of many people in the audience, I suspect, is about a great example of how hard water and soft water influences the characteristics of brewing malt extraction and explains some of the different characteristics that we see in drinking ale. And here's an example um, of a well-known Irish stout um, that you might drink when it's brewed in Dublin and it has a distinctive grainy flavour. And one of the real controls on that is the, um, the water that's used uh, comes from a carboniferous limestone aquifer. And the properties of that water has a real influence on, it actually makes it quite difficult for malt extraction from that grain. If you have that same Irish stout that's made elsewhere, for example, in London, people often complain that it tastes somehow different. Perhaps people are doing different things to it. The reality is the main difference that we see is due to differences in water chemistry. And that's because the groundwater there is coming from a Cretaceous chalk 
aquifer or hosted aquifer. And so therefore it has completely different um, hydrogeochemical characteristics, which in turn changes the flavor of the beer. Building onto that, some great examples of, of toxicity and deficiency, particularly um, chemical ones, um, that are also controlled by um, geoscience. And some of the great examples are, uh, the, is the one around iodine deficiency and goiter, uh, which is a, a thyroid condition that's really, as I said, controlled by iodine deficiency. The interesting thing with that is that links back to things such as proximity to the sea and, and um, ingesting iodine through um, marine food, but also um, the last glacial um, history or the last time of glaciation in the world and the leaching of soils and so forth of iodine as the ice melted from those systems, which has led to local deficiencies, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. Although there's even talk about goiter occurrences in Tasmania that could link to that same situation. Um, plant nutrient deficiencies and toxicities are very well known and established, particularly in the agriculture industry. And it's really had a big effect on how we produce food in Australia. Great examples of the importance of molybdenite for clover growth in um, Australia, um, but also how phosphate has revolutionized how we can grow um, grains in Southern Australia. And one that um, is perhaps close to my heart because um, when I'm not in Canberra, I'm in Adelaide trying to grow citrus and the um, alkaline soils there have a um, very strong um, lime-induced cholerosis problem, which looks like an iron um, deficiency. Um, but there's, even though there's plenty of iron in the soil, the actual um, carbonates and the lime lock that iron up and don't make it available to the plants. And let's not forget that the people that have been living here for, for many thousands of years, Indigenous people have a close association between landscape, which in turn relates to geology, and then also their availability of food. So critical for them is not about going to the supermarket. Critical there has been knowing about how to read and understand country for both food and water. It also explains phenomena like sickness country, um, seasonal migration of Indigenous people to suit different food availabilities, and also the sustainability of those foods within the geoscience context of a landscape. So there's some of those relationships, but there's actually some rocks and minerals that we can examples there of some of them. Um, what I want to do now is um, actually, or well, the most common one, of course, is, is halite. Table salt is probably the most common um, mineral that we eat, particularly with potatoes. Um, also, um, I just want to highlight titanium dioxide, which is actually quite a controversial food additive um, and, and questions about its safety, but very has been in the past, at least, very common as a white pigment, even into um, different types of confectionery and so forth, um, toothpaste and, and, and even, um, um, yeah, a whole lot of things like that. So um, there's some there, but the one that I want to focus on, uh, Andy, if you could just click on four, or it will talk about, we'll talk a little bit about kaolin and how we eat that. So kaolin is a very common white clay in Australia, highly sought after uh, in high purity. And actually geologists, when they're looking at kaolin, can test the purity of kaolin by taking a bit of it and just placing it on their tongue. And a very pure sample of kaolin will actually stick to your tongue. Um, it's used a lot in ceramics, so white china clay, but also as a as a filler in food and pharmaceuticals. And one of the main examples is that it was once widely used as a filler in dog food. And if you think about it, you don't see this so much anymore, but the occurrence of the white doggy poo on the ground is in part a reflection of um, how we used to feed dogs a lot of cooked bones. So there's a lot of ground bone matter in there, but also a large part, particularly as the um, dog feces weather and leach, and they become white is because of the kaolin that had been ingested in some of the cheaper dog foods that were used as filler. Now, if you don't believe me that that's kaolin, you can always take a bit of it and just test it on your tongue. And if it sticks to your tongue, then you can tell everyone how clever you are and that it's kaolin. And um, another example of um, people eating minerals and rocks is of course the phenomena of geophagy. And this is the intentional eating of earth or soil-like substances. Um, very 
widely done in um, a lot of um, marine and um, fresh water uh, reptiles and amphibians. They will swallow stones or gastroliths to act as a ballast, but also to help them digest food. And of course, a lot of birds do that as well. Um, so um, animals, very important to eat those stones to help them break down food. Um, but also in parts of Africa, um, the cultures there um, as in, as support people, um, particularly pregnant women eating clay biscuits. Um, in parts of South America, it's been observed that some of the parrots there will eat particular paleo soil horizons. And it's thought that they do that in order to target the salts that are in those soils for their eating. And the last example I've got up on screen there is that every time I go south of Canberra into the Monero district and um, you end up seeing these beautiful bulk sites, these red ancient soils there, you find that they're often um, favoured by cows and sheep that um, lick the bulk sites. And um, I, I presume that what they're doing there is also extracting salt into their diet. And just to wrap up my bit, I want to now talk about that bigger system approach to how geoscience interacts with food. And when we look at the entire food system, we can see areas where geoscience is absolute, makes, makes a critical contribution to how we take food from its production through its harvest and transport and then into its preparation and consumption. In the next slide, we'll see how a systems approach for both earth systems and food systems can be combined. And if you think about it, the food that we're consuming results from an earth system that's been operating for millions of years that's combined with that food production system. And so let's just, to wrap it up, um, consider a glass of Australian Shiraz. Um, and, the, and a great place for producing Shiraz is just south of Adelaide uh, in the McLaren Vale. Um, and you can see that we have a whole lot of ancient rocks that have been uplifted to form the Adelaide Hills. And then we have these small basins um, where um, to the south of Adelaide, one of those is uh, corresponds to the McLaren Vale, which has been a great area for growing grapes. You can already see that there's a strong geological control on the McLaren Vale, particularly from the faulting of these rocks. We can see that our glass of McLaren Vale Shiraz um, really draws on an earth system history that starts with some of those ancient um, Paleoproterozoic, Neoproterozoic, Cambrian rocks, then into these Permian rocks that were part of the Gondwana supercontinent. And we can see that continent breaking up. And as it's broken up, Australia has been drifting northwards. It's currently moving at seven centimetres a year to the north, slightly east of north. And that's moved us into different climate zones, which has impacted on the erosion and the soil production in the area and particularly the glacial cycles uh, where we've had a lot of windblown material and ongoing faulting that has, in this case at Salix Beach, south of Adelaide, shows that we've had tilting of the um, older limestones and also uplift of ancient um, beach shorelines. It's a great site. And then, of course, that, that wine production in the McLaren Vale is also challenged by the geoscience implications of our urban sprawl and development. Um, where we're seeing increasing urbanisation pressure on these um, wine growing areas and the resources such as water that go with that. And then lastly, we see that production of grapes and how that has really built on that whole earth system story that includes climate change, sea level change and plate tectonics. And that's just to put the grapevines in the ground and doesn't talk about the glass that we might be drinking out of and the wine production. Thank you, everybody. I hope that that's changed some of the ways that you think about food. I now would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Andrew Carroll. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much, Steve, for the introduction. Um, my name is Andrew Carroll. Uh, I'm a marine ecologist with Geoscience Australia. And today I'll be talking to you about fish finding important seabed habitat and how this relates to the um, or support, how it supports the, the blue economy. So Australia's marine jurisdiction is enormous. It covers nearly 14 million square kilometres, which is about 4% of our global ocean area. And this makes it the third largest marine jurisdiction in the world, next to France and the United States. 
And an important part of managing our marine jurisdiction is mapping the seafloor and the geology beneath it. And we do this with multi-beam bathymetry and seismic surveys. So during a bathymetric survey, a multi-beam sonar, which is mounted to the hull of a, of a survey vessel, uh, sends out multiple sound waves that bounce off the seafloor and return to the ship. And the delay between sending and receiving the signal provides a measurement of ocean depth. And this gives us a good understanding of what the seafloor topography looks like. Um, indeed, we've been doing this for some 50 years to better understand our marine estate. And this provides fundamental geological information that has helped um, in our geological studies of, of, of the earth and our, our resource exploration through to the redefinition of our maritime boundaries, expanding our maritime boundaries, uh, the declaration of the world's largest network of marine parks and other applications like the search for MH370. All of these things adhere to Geoscience Australia's science principles um, and relate to and align with our 2028 strategy and indeed our marine strategy as it relates to the national coordination of seabed mapping and uh, the provision of expert marine geoscience advice. So we might ask, what does all this mean to the beautiful red snapper that ends up on your dinner plate? Well, it's all about finding important seabed habitat. So if we look at satellite data just quickly, we can use this to produce um, maps showing general features over large areas of seabed, but this is typically in low resolution. Equipment, on the other hand, that captures swaths of the data, so airborne laser measurements and multi-beam echo sounders, um, acquires this in very high resolution, up to a metre here in the Windmill Islands of Antarctica, for example. And we often work collaboratively with other universities or with, with universities and other government agencies to integrate satellite, aircraft and vessel acquired bathymetry. And what this does is allow us to produce some uh, amazing regional uh, images, uh, bathymetry images, and that provides a, a, a really important insight into the habitat around our continental shelf. So it's all about resolution. Uh, seabed mapping data is used specifically by the fishing industry to, yes, safely navigate uh, the sea, but also to inform um, uh, aquaculture and, and fishing site selection. So here we have a 2009 bathymetry data set of McDonald Islands. Yeah, it's an Australian external territory. And by unlocking new data sourced from fishing vessels and combining this with research um, vessel acquired bathymetry, we're able to improve the resolution of this. So we're going to go from 100 metres resolution in this image. And what you'll slowly see starting to form is this 30 metre image of the seafloor that reveals a whole range of sea mounts, which are, of course are important to fisheries and conservation management. So what this does is, is sort of show how high resolution bathymetry can increase the efficiency of uh, fishing. Uh, it can reduce the, the costs associated with fishing, especially in the, the Southern Ocean, and can minimize environmental impacts through the reduction in bycatch. Seabed mapping can also reveal important bed forms on the seafloor and that can uh, be very insightful in terms of identifying potential habitat for commercially important species. So if we take uh, the Gippsland Basin here and some multi-beam bathymetry and we sort of have a look at this blown up a little bit, we can see all these 2D sand ripples and bed forms that provide um, a bit of an idea of where this scallop habitat is and can help inform stock assessments for the scallop fishing industry. Uh, bathymetry data is also used, and this is important, to identify and declare marine protected areas and scientific reference sites for ongoing monitoring. Now, this is important for um, protecting areas that we don't want to fish, for example. So seamounts, platform reefs like Middleton Reef, 
the reefs associated with the Lord Howe uh, Seamount chain of the east, off the east coast of Australia, support an astonishingly diverse and abundant marine life. And these can be important habitat for a lot of threatened and migratory species. So areas we want to conserve. Uh, bathymetry can also help to reveal biodiversity hotspots. So if we take, again, this coarse grid and, and view of the seafloor in the oceanic shoals in the Timor Sea, and we do our seabed mapping and reveal this two metre resolution grid, all of a sudden we're seeing these beautiful shoal features which provide important habitat for sponges, corals and fish communities, so areas that we want to protect. So there's increase, increasing global demand for energy and food, as, as Steve mentioned, and security. And all of these things um, mean that activity within our big, massive, vast marine jurisdiction is becoming increasingly important to the economy. Uh, the economy and this is particularly the case uh, coming out of COVID. So each year, seabed mapping data directly contributes $9 billion to the Australian economy and employs a lot of people. The value of offshore production of, um, from wild catch fisheries and agriculture alone was $3 billion in 2018 19. And by 2025, marine industries are predicted to contribute $100 billion to the Australian economy each year. Now, having said all of that, it's very important, but despite our reliance on the marine environment, our knowledge of the seafloor is very limited to the point where only 25% of the seafloor around Australia has been mapped at a suitable resolution to inform the sustainable management of its marine resources. So that kind of means that we know more about Mars than we do about the seafloor. So oceans cover more than 70% of our planet and over 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, um, unexplored. Uh, Mars, on the other hand, well, almost 100% or 100% of the surface has at least been mapped. So this presents a bit of an issue. We know that the offshore environment is important. We know that bathymetry data is important for making sure that we select the right areas to put sea cage aquaculture to meet this growing demand for food, to identify fishing grounds, as we've just demonstrated, and even other offshore aquaculture um, activities uh, like like seaweed that also presents a great blue economy opportunity. Um, with the global market for a, for, for seaweed predicted to uh, reach about $30 billion by the year 2025. And it's just not about what we eat. Um, the large scale uh, cultivation of some Australian seaweed species is projected to feed at least 30% of Australia's cattle herd by 2025. And this does a lot of things by, uh, in terms of reducing the emissions um, from cattle, cattle to almost zero. So it has an important role. So how are we, how are we dealing with this, this challenge of, of limited seabed um, mapping data available to, to the Australian community? Well, in, 19, in 2016, um, Oz Seabed was, was developed. It's a national uh, coordination uh, project initiative that uh, is led by Geoscience Australia, but operated by government, universities, and a number of other collaborators. And it aims to serve the Australian community that's relying on the, on the production of seabed mapping data to, to go about their activity. It also supports um, those global initiatives to map the ocean by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, this time next week, you'll be able to hear from Kim Pickard, who will be delivering a Wednesday seminar uh, that will describe some of the progress that we're making in terms of how do we make seabed data more available to the Australian community. So from the seafloor to satellites, I'll now hand over to Claire and thank you all for listening. 
Thanks very much, Andy. Okay, so Andy's just given you a really great overview of Australia's marine um, jurisdictions and how we can use information around that to look at fisheries. I'm going to take you on land here um, and we're going to look at agriculture at scale using satellite imagery. So Geoscience Australia has a program called Digital Earth Australia, which looks after Australia's free and open satellite imagery. And that program, um, that satellite imagery has been collecting routine imagery over the entire Australian continent for over 30 years. We have a very rich um, uh, uh, catalogue of, of um, satellite imagery that we can use um, to look at agriculture. And I'm just going to show you some of the examples of the things that you can start to see um, using that imagery. So on the screen here, we have an image um, of Sentinel-2. And Sentinel-2 is a satellite run by the European Space Agency um, and the European Commission. And every three to five days, it takes a complete picture of the Australian continent at 10 metre resolution. And the fact that it's revisiting is what makes this a really powerful tool for monitoring agriculture. So here's an image from Sentinel-2. Um, it's taken uh, somewhere just to the uh, west of Leeton in New South Wales. And this is what you would see if you were sitting up in the, in the International Space Station looking down. This is what we call a true colour image. So it's using the red, green, blue spectral bands. Um, and basically you can think of it as a photograph. So here we have uh, a particular point in time. It's um, around uh, December. And you can see when looking at it that there's a sort of a a tapestry of paddocks across the con across this particular um, screen grab. You can kind of make out some green areas that might be paddocks and you can see a lot of brown. And one thing that's really difficult to do with satellite imagery is to actually understand more specifically what we're looking at in terms of agriculture. So it's very difficult to say whether we're looking at chickpeas or we're looking at cotton or we're looking at apple orchards or any other um, green thing that's in the landscape. But the power of the satellite um, imagery is that we get revisits. Um, and also, we're actually getting information in wavelengths that the human eye doesn't see. So I'm going to show you now an image of exactly the same scene in false colour. And so what the false colour image does is it takes um, information from the near infrared and the short wave infrared spectrum, so stuff that our eyes wouldn't be able to see, and it just makes it visible. So here we have bright green, which is where we're seeing our green vegetation. The blue colour is water, so it makes it really easy to see where water is because um, in Australia, water isn't necessarily blue. A lot of it is quite dirty. And when you're just looking at a picture, it's really hard to see whether you're looking at a, a paddock or, or actual water. So we use the false colour imagery to tell us. And the kind of red colour is where you're seeing that bare soil. So in this particular image, um, we actually have some really interesting things going on. So if you can see um, the, I'll just turn my little laser pointer on. If you can see these paddocks here that are sort of a, a greeny blue color, what we actually have here is water and vegetation combined. So we either have a crop that's growing that's been inundated or actually green stuff growing out of an inundated paddock. And so this starts to give us a little bit of an information and some hints about what we might actually be looking at here. So as we move forward in time, you can see um, we're going to look at one particular paddock and just track that through these few slides. So in the next slide, you can see that particular paddock, it's no longer bright green. So what that tells us is either the vegetation has died off or something has happened, maybe it was harvested. But you can also see that the background landscape has started to dry out and those green areas that have been irrigated are really starting to pop. And the piece of information that tells us what we're looking at here are actually rice paddies is this screen grab here. So in Australia, in autumn, when the rice is harvested, the, the farmers actually burn the stubble. And so you can see that we've got a whole bunch of paddocks now that have started to turn black. And that's actually the stubble being burnt after harvest. So while we can't necessarily tell about what crop we're looking at from a single image, we can make use of the fact that the satellite is constantly revisiting the same area and use that information over time to start to infer what we might be looking at. So here we have a beautiful image of canola. I was lucky enough one time to happen to drive past a canola field in full bloom. There are about 60 people um, who pulled over on the side of the road to get out and take their Instagram photos. But this is um, actually a really beautiful phenomenon that um, happens. And what you can see um, 
is that we can actually see it from space. So here we have the same image and we're back into true colour here. So this yellowy, greeny colour you're seeing is actually just the flowers um, showing you when the, the, the particular paddocks are blooming. And to give you an idea of the scale at which we can see this particular crop bl uh, blooming, here's a zoom out um, of that area. And here we have a swath. So the, the satellite is collecting information in lines throughout Australia that we call swaths. And so you can actually see the swath boundaries. You've got um, the imagery here and here that kind of, um, and then teeters off to the background. And just for scale, we have the entirety of the ACT sitting just over here and there's Lake George. So you can see the scale at which we can make use of satellite imagery and see this huge area to the west of the ACT all blooming yellow and therefore we can make inferences that this is a giant canola um, harvest, uh, sorry, harv uh, crop and we can make so, get some understanding around um, how much area that might have taken up in particular production year. So in Australia things happen big. This here is an image of a flood moving through inland Australia and again we're looking at the swath scale and so that blue that you can see in these three different time periods is actually a massive flood front moving from Queensland down towards Lake Eyre, or at least towards the, the Lake Eyre Basin. And I've put a little scale bar on there just to show you the scale at which this happens. And so we get these huge phenomena happening across the Australian landscape and the satellites are actually operating at the perfect scale to track them. And things like this are really important for food production because you can imagine that if you've got huge walls of water moving into areas that had been dry, you have both a, a positive and a negative. You have a huge wall of water, not necessarily like a tsunami, they're more of a little trickle that kind of just keeps going. Um, but you now have water in places that it wasn't previously, which opens up the opportunity for um, planting crops and having um, the water available to actually grow things. Um, but you also need to manage the water itself. So if you do have something sitting in the way, um, you can see this moving down through the continent um, every three days or so. You can see there's a few days in between because there was a bit of cloud in the way. Um, but you can actually start to track these giant phenomena moving across the landscape. And the last example I wanted to show you is actually um, tracking a natural disaster with through the lens of food. So here we have a screen grab of the Batlow region. So hopefully if I say Batlow, you think apples. Um, so it's just to the east of Tumut, to the west of Canberra. So kind of in that, um, the, the Great Dividing Range area. And what you can see here are a whole lot of tiny little gray squares. And what those gray squares are, are actually the, the netting from the apple orchards. So even though we can't directly see apple trees in this imagery, we can infer from the image, um, the gray kind of squares that we see, where the apples are actually growing. So unfortunately, this part of the country um, was hit during the 2019-2020 fire season. And this is a screen grab from the 3rd of January in 2020. And what you're seeing here is a whole lot of smoke. So using just our you know, camera out the window of a space station view of, of this area, you can't really see very much. But what you can see is when you make take advantage of those infrared and shortwave infrared bands in this false color image, you can actually make out the fire front itself. So these little red lines that you see here are actually the active fire front. And during the 2019-2020 fire season, we were regularly providing um, updated satellite imagery of these fire fronts. In addition, there's a product called Digital Earth Australia Hotspots that looks for anomalies in temperature. So basically it says, this is a forest, normally it's this temperature, we're now seeing it much warmer than it used, than we would expect it to be as an anomaly. And then it flags it. And it's one of the tools that we were making use of during that fire season to help track the movement of the fire front. And it's really powerful, particularly in areas where humans can't go or where it's unsafe to send a helicopter or something to do reconnaissance. So here we unfortunately have this big fire front coming towards um, Batlow. Um, and when the fire front had passed, this is what was left behind. So we're still in false colour. And so what we can now see are these huge burnt areas. So they are in the kind of brown, yellow, um, orange, kind of burnt rust colours. And you can still see there's some green areas in the middle. And that's actually the town front, the township itself that was, was um, saved from 
the, from the active um, efforts of the firefighters. And here's an image 12 months on. So instantly you go, oh, wow, it's very bright. And that's great. It means the vegetation has largely grown back. Um, but what I wanted to show you was this in true colour where you can start seeing all those little apple orchard nettings again. And you can see these giant fire scars that are still in the landscape. So there's a big one down here just to the south of this, um, this dam. You can see a big fire scar where the, where the um, vegetation hasn't recovered. And again, quite a few here to the north west of the town where you still have a lot of brown. But making use of the time history of satellite imagery, we can start putting those images side by side and looking at the impact that the fire had on this community. And thankfully, most of the, um, the orchards survived. There were a few that were damaged um, towards the north of the town. But if you sit here and kind of look back and forward between the two, you can see that by and large, most of these um, orchards were able to be protected. And that's why knowing where something exists, having those real-time intelligence from satellite imagery combined with the hotspots data was really vital for protecting this beautiful community and the lovely apples that they make. So going from satellite imagery to individual localized scale, I'm just gonna to pass to Anna, um, who's gonna talk about paddock to plate using positioning. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire. We've heard a little bit about um, talking around the blue blue economy. So that's that large scale, planet scale. Then Claire's beautifully brought it down to that, um, I guess, economies of scale again and how we're talking about food at scale at that continent or that regional level. And now we're going to bring it down again from paddock to plate, but thinking about it in terms of using positioning. So very simply, positioning is where you put something or someone and, and then you can locate it with a coordinate. Now, our position on the globe is essential to everyday life. An accurate and reliable position and is needed to uh, enable to locate ourselves, manoeuvre people, cars, tractors and even drones. Precise positioning underpins thousands of technologies which help us at work, also keep us safe and improve our lifestyles. And so I guess positioning and navigation have become very ubiquitous in our everyday lives. Um, each of us carries at least one location enabled device on our person, if not more. So have a think about the mobile phone in your pocket and its navigation capabilities. And then you've also got um, perhaps a smartwatch or a fitness tracker that also tracks where you're going and where you've been. And then positioning is also used by many other industries, whether that be surveying, uh, construction in agriculture particularly, but then also the transport part of it as well, whether that's by road, rail or maritime. But have you ever stopped to think about the role positioning plays in our food industry? And so with my, I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about precision agriculture, food delivery services, and even knowing where your food comes from in the first place. And of course, all of this relies on knowing the location or the position and then being able to navigate. And all of these are services that are provided by satellite navigation systems like GPS. And so imagine that you're working on a broad acre farm and you've got an integrated system of equipment where you can send out a drone to capture some beautiful imagery similar to the imagery that Claire was just showing. Um, you've got that beautiful satellite imagery sitting underneath and you identify from that that perhaps there's some sections where there's a few weeds that you want to go and check out with your drone. And so you send your drone out. The drone needs to know where it is in order for you to then locate that across the patch where you think might, might have a few weeds. You can identify those and then perhaps you send out another piece of autonomous equipment that's also location enabled to go and specifically target that very weed, that one weed. So instead of spraying the whole crop with pesticide, or um, herbicide, you're just spraying that one location. This is sort of uh, the thinking around integrated systems and how positioning can play a, a, a role in our food industry. Then we've got all of this uh, amazing tech and you can start to combine it. And so precise technology enables the tractors to be talking to each other and to know where the other one is. So this is not only about efficiency, it's about safety. You can drive along designate, designated wheel tracks, which is then maximising the cropping area and as a result improves the yield for your agriculture. Positioning allows seeds to be sown precisely between the previous year's row, meaning um, that 
then other inputs such as waters and fertilizers and herbicides can be applied directly over the crop with less wastage. And then this starts to begin to negate the need to clear the crop for, or stubble from the previous harvest, bringing additional cost savings into this whole process to the farmer. There's also less risk of chemicals entering waterways and degrading the water quality. And following the same wheel tracks along a designated wheel track reduces damage to the soil and reduces compaction, which is a, uh, quite important in some pieces of agriculture. And so then other smart technologies and other smart integrated systems start to, can start to be introduced. Here we're seeing an image where you can set the height of the header specific to the height of the crop that's being harvested. So you're not taking too much of the stalk or you're not chopping the grain head in half. And that can be adaptive as well. If you've already surveyed the field or got some imagery over the field and you know the crop height, you can then dynamically adjust the, the height of the header because you know the location of the piece of equipment and the location of the crop itself. And of course, then you're starting to think about all of these auto steer and autonomous systems. Well, you need to know where you can and can't go. So you can start to build boundaries into your farm or you don't want to accidentally uh, roll into your neighbor's property as well. And so this all links to our understanding of reference frames and knowing where they are. So I've talked a little bit about precision ag and getting the food in the paddock, but then how does that get to our plant? Again, positioning can play a role um, in intelligent transport. And so noting the increasing demands uh, around transport facilities and the need to improve our road safety, this has prompted authorities around the world, it's not just in Australia, to place more emphasis on the application of advanced technologies to enhance the operation and safety and all of the modes of transport, again, whether that's by road, rail or maritime. And many of these advanced aspects of intelligent transport are not possible without positioning. And so across Australia in particular, we've seen significant benefits from the deployment of um, dynamic speed zones, active lane management, um, ramp metering, and also traveler information systems. And all of this plays into the idea that making the transport more efficient gets the food from our plate a little bit quicker. Now, I know that uh, quite a few of us have entered lockdown and I'm sure, I'm sure that correlates with a spike of food delivery. And so if you think about all of the food delivery services that have become quite normal in our everyday lives, again, these rely on knowing the location of the driver or the delivery person that's bringing that food to your door. And it's even got to that point where you can look up on an app or on a map where, that, where your food is and the predicted time that it's gonna arrive at your door. And so that idea of everything has a location and that information is being piped or ported to you is pretty pretty phenomenal in my mind that we can uh, see when your food's gonna arrive, you can set the table and you can have everybody ready to go. Another idea around knowing where your food comes from is very much that food, food provenance, I guess. And so there's an Australian owned and operated company that's introduced a new labeling system that enables the consumers or the customers to be able to trace every pack of free range chicken back to the farm where that chicken has come from. And so the idea of knowing where your food come from, comes from introduces that idea of sustainability and um, understanding that if you don't necessarily want the food to travel across country, perhaps you wanna eat locally. And there's also quite a few um, initiatives around building an Australian food provenance infrastructure, which is one of the six work packages in our trusted agri-food um, exports initiative that's being headed up by the CSIRO. And so we've talked a lot about positioning and location, but of course there's a huge amount of infrastructure that sits behind that. And part of the Positioning Australia program here at Geoscience Australia is very much about enabling new technologies to leverage off some of the positioning infrastructure that we are currently building, but also maintaining. And so there will be um, a significant increase in the accuracy of the positioning that's able to be accessed over across Australia. So we're talking about a 10 centimetre anywhere, anytime accuracy that's delivered by satellite, and that's part of the SouthPan program. But then in areas where you do have access to mobile phone or internet coverage, we're talking about um, driving down or getting down to an accuracy of about three centimetres in coverage. So at the moment, your mobile phone or your other positioning device, if it's just leveraging off one of the, the navigation satellite systems with no input corrections, it's about 
good to five metres. So if you think of the bubble on your map, um, but we're introducing this infrastructure that will help drive that down. And of course, that's supported by a suite of tools um, and online systems, one of those which is called GNAN. And so if you'd like to check out more, I encourage you to have a look at the Geoscience Australia webpage. There's a lot of information on that. Um, I think we're running fairly close to the end of time. So I'm going to hand back to our moderator, Steve, and thank you all for tuning in. There's a question there from Ian Wolf around the vertical accuracy of the positioning that you were speaking around, Anna. Sure. So I guess it does very much depend on which system you are using for vertical accuracy. Um, I read recently that if you're using, I guess, a GPS only enabled device without any other correction streams, you're aiming at about um, the meter level, which is probably not enough for precision ag. When you start talking about positioning using some of the differential correction services that are available, you can get that down uh, to the centimetre level, which is far more useful when you're talking about um, crop heights and headering and things like that. So there are, it, it depends on the equipment and it depends on what you're using it for, but you can get down to the centimetre level for height. Okay, we have another question for you, Anna, from David Collins. Will South Pan data be free? Uh, yes, it will. It will be openly accessible. Next question is from Eamon Lai. For Claire this time, he's wondering how well identification of crop types occur using satellites. Uh, can it be done without using local knowledge of dominant production like certain products? Or are the satellites better placed to monitor the agriculture once you know or can guess what crops dominate the area? Thanks, Eamon. So crop monitoring, um, crop type monitoring is actually really difficult to do with satellite imagery, um, mainly because from space, green vegetation looks green no matter what type of crop it is. Usually it's those additional lines of evidence that we can make use of to actually identify crops. So things like looking for the burn for rice um, or the, top, the, the meshing for apples. Um, there's a lot of active research being done in this area, particularly overseas. Um, in Australia, there is also active research being done, but it's on a much smaller scale. So um, essentially, we don't do crop type monitoring at the moment. It's not entirely possible. Um, and But once you do have those other lines of evidence, so if you knew for an example that this particular paddock was growing, um, was growing chickpea, then you can actually monitor that, um, the greenness and, and the kind of, um, cycle of that particular paddock, but we wouldn't be able to tell you it was chickpea in the first place. So definitely those additional lines of evidence are really important for, the, for that work. Okay, a couple more we have here. One from Julia asking, the farming sector has traditionally been hesitant to share farm data. How is this social barrier being overcome? Uh, thanks for the question, Julia. So we're not uh, asking anybody, I guess, or well, farmers, for their own data. What we're providing here is the infrastructure and the data streams that allow them to access um, positioning enhancement, I guess, or positioning data. So we're not asking for anything from them. We are providing a service back to that community. Thank you. And perhaps the final one from David. You mentioned Digital Earth Australia. Is there imagery available to the general public? Yes, absolutely. Everything that we do in Digital Earth Australia is free and openly available. So that includes the imagery as well as the underlying technologies, all of the science that we do on top of it, all completely free and open. If you're interested in accessing it, um, go onto the GA website and look for the Digital Earth Australia program. Um, if you're having trouble, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. Okay, and Charles has just snuck in with one final question for Claire. Can you use the archived images to catch water irrigation cheaters? So at Geoscience Australia, we don't actually do water compliance, but we do work with the government bodies that do do water compliance. Um, and we're actively involved in some projects and collaborations, helping them to make use of satellite imagery to do water compliance. So yes, it's something that we can do. Geoscience Australia as an agency doesn't do it, but we are engaging with the people who do do that, in, that sort of um, work. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to the other people that have put questions now. We'll have to call it quits there, but the any unanswered questions will be dealt with. We'll contact you with the appropriate person to answer your queries.
Okay, well, on behalf of the Chief Scientist, thank you for participating in today's National Science Week seminar for 2021. Next week, we hope you'll return again for another engaging talk uh, entitled OS Seabed, Three Years of Coordinating Seabed Mapping Efforts. Are we there yet? This will be presented by our own Kim Picard and members of the OS Seabed community. Uh, more information about that talk will be up on our public talk site very soon after this talk finishes. Thank you very much for your participation today.